This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. This is your host, Tim Link, and I'm so glad you're joining us today. Our special guest today will be author extraordinaire Melinda Metz. We're going to talk to Melinda a little bit about her latest book, Talk to the Paw. Uh, so I love the cover, uh, Animal Lovers Watch Out, This Cat Can Steal Your Heart. So perfect for this time of year, perfect for those mischievous kitties out there, and it's a real uh, cool story, and I'll let Melinda tell us a little bit about it in a moment. So it's going to be fun. Everybody uh, hang tight. We'll come back right for this commercial break. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Not pumped about cleaning the litter box? Try World's Best Cat Litter Zero Mess, the litter that gives you two times better clumping and more odor control with less litter. That's right. You scoop once and you're done. No chiseling, no scraping, no crumbling, no problem. Looking for fast and easy litter box cleanup? Zero Mess. Try it. You're welcome in advance. Save $2 on World's Best Cat Litter. Visit www.saveonworldsbest.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. And joining us now is the author of Talk to the Paw, Melinda Metz. And uh, Melinda, just to give you a background, Melinda is the uh, co-author of the Roswell High series, which is uh, for you Roswell fans, a television show. It's uh, The book has the basis of the hit television show, Roswell. So if you're a big Roswell fan, you'll definitely want to listen to this show with Melinda. She's also a um, Edgar Award nominee for her book, uh, Wright and Wong Mystery Series. And uh, we're excited about uh, having Melinda on the show. So, Melinda, without further ado, welcome to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. And congratulations on the, the big hit, the latest book, Talk to the Paw. Tell us a little bit about the book, the premise, without giving away all the super secrets and endings in here. But give us the idea of what the book's all about. Well, my editor called me up because he had gotten really intrigued by all the videos about cats stealing things, and he thought that there could be a book in it. And first he was thinking he wanted to do a nonfiction book about all these different kleptomaniac cats. And then he decided he'd rather do something more of a romance where the cat kind of, I have the cat MacGyver be able to smell that his person, Jamie, is lonely, and he sets out to find a guy for her. And he does it by stealing things from the guy and dropping them off on her porch. So and that's the basic setup. Yeah, and so uh, and now this is uh, unbeknownst to her, I'm assuming, how kitty cats uh, yes. will do things without us knowing about it until the last minute. Yes, she's very confused at first because <laughs> he brings things like dirty socks and bathing suits and crazy stuff. <laughs> so would you call this uh, a sort of a, a true romance with some uh, mysteries that uh, MacGyver the cat's putting into play? Or how would you label it when you took on the project? How did you envision this whole thing? I think that at the heart of it, it's a romance, but it, MacGyver helps a lot of people and he meddles in romances sometimes, but sometimes he takes on other problems. So there's not much of a mystery because part of it is from MacGyver's point of view. So we kind of know from the beginning that MacGyver is taking care of his person by, by doing these things, but she doesn't know. <laughs> now with MacGyver, as far as the kinds of items that uh, he's sort of uh, taken under his wing and bringing into the house, is, it, is there a certain purpose and reason he brings each one, or is it more of an attention getter? Well, he has a much better sense of smell than people do, and um, so he knows that people can't smell as well as he does. So he brings things that are really, really smelly because he thinks that then she'll be able to pick up on it if he gets something that's really kind of ripe. So his big selection process for her is just what is really smelly, like the guy gone jogging. And so he brings the t-shirt that's kind of drenched in sweat or, you know, he brings, he just brings weird smelly stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true. I think with most animals, especially cats, they like giving you the, uh, the smelliest, the grossest presence they could possibly have as a, an honor to you and drop them at your doorstep typically. Yeah. He's not bringing things that would intrigue her and think, I wonder who this belongs to. It must be a really interesting person. It's just kind of, smelly stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, then tell us about, and this is uh, your editor came to you and said, hey, you know, let's write this book about these videos, these klepto kitty videos that we've been seeing out there. Tell us a little bit about that background. I'm sure most of the listeners know about it, but for those that don't, what are those videos all about and why are they so darn popular? 
Well, if you go online and put in kleptomaniac cats on YouTube, you'll come up with a whole bunch of them. And I think Gary Goldstein, my editor, the first one that he became intrigued with was the one that was out in Oregon where the kitty belonged to someone that was on the police force. And he started bringing all these things back. And the his owner, the police officer, mounted a surveillance camera outside the driveway. And then he found that the kitty was bringing all these things. The kitty actually even brought a little bag of pot and left it on the driveway. So maybe he knew that his person was the one that took care of those kind of things. I don't know. But then there are lots of amazing ones. Like there was, um, I think it was a cat in Switzerland that he never stole anything until after his couple that he lived with became pregnant. And then he started bringing all these stuffed animals home. Like he knew that the baby would want stuffed animals. So that was a cute one. (laughs) Now, are you personally into the kitty klepto or any of the kitty videos out there? I've watched many kitty videos. They're kind of addictive. (laughs) So I've watched all the klepto kitties that I can find. (laughs) Now, with that, I found it interesting. Now, have you worked with your editor before on other projects, or was this something where he knew this would be right up your alley? And what were your thoughts when you uh, you know, first got the call or the email saying, here's what we'd like for you guys to do, for you to put together for us? You know, Gary and I never worked together as editor and writer before, but he and I both worked at Berkeley Publishing back in the mid-80s, a long time ago, and we were both editors there at the same time, and he knew that I was a freelance writer now, and um, he knows my agent, and he just, yeah, I think he just thought that I would be good at it. So and I was intrigued because I've never written anything for adults before. And um, I used to edit romance, but I'd never really written a romance. So I was intrigued by both parts of it and thought it would be fun. And it was fun. And so the uh, interesting twist behind the book, uh, how much play went into actually doing your research for it and watching all the videos and getting all the latest stuff for this type of book compared to maybe other books that you've done? Is it Was it more research intensive or was it more of you wanted to delve into the characters and try to develop characters that people uh, would relate to? It probably falls somewhere in the middle. Um, the right and long mysteries that you mentioned, the the boy in, their, in the stories had Asperger's syndrome and um, – My writing partner, Laura, I write with her a lot, but I didn't for this particular book. But we did a lot of research because we're trying to understand sort of the way he viewed the world. And also he had really specific interests like the Wright brothers. So we had to research a lot of that. But I did research on cat behavior and I wanted to know more about cat body language. I've had cats although I've gotten horribly allergic now, but I kind of understand how they moved and some of the things they did, but I wanted to sort of know why and, you know, what I didn't really know about the organ that they had inside their mouth that kind of enhanced their sense of smell in a different way. And so I I did some research just on on cat cat body language and psychology (laughs) besides just watching the cat videos. And I think it's important when you say that, you know, a lot of people think, well, possibly, you know, you're putting together a fiction book. So all you have to do is come up with some key characters and create a nice narrative and a nice uh, twist behind it. But there's actually in this type of thing, especially when you're dealing with uh, animals, there is that great deal of research because you want to make sure you get it right. Right. Like cats like to rub their heads against you kind of to mark that you're that you're theirs and lots of different things that were interesting about cats. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick commercial break and come back to uh, talk to Melinda Metz a little bit more about her book, Talk to the Paw, as well as I want to talk to Melinda a little bit about her overall writing styles. What's it take to be a successful uh, freelance writer and uh, how does her background in editing come into play? So everybody hang tight. We're going to come back right after this commercial break. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. Does your dog itch, scratch, stink, or shed like crazy? Come to Dynavite for help. Order a 90-day supply of Dynavite. Dynavite is nutrition. Pick up two bottles of Lico Chops. Get the third bottle free. New improved Lico Chops with omega-3, omega-6, vitamin E. And now, six extra direct-fed microbials. Even better for the digestive tract and immune system. Try Lico Chops. Buy two, get one free. At Dynavite.com. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. If you've ever shared your home and heart with a charmingly naughty animal who's always up to mischief, (laughs) you'll fall in love with the Klepto Kitty who stars in Talk to the Paw by Melinda Metz. Talk to the Paw is a funny, heartwarming novel about a single girl, a single guy, and MacGyver, an adorable tabby cat with a not-so-adorable habit of stealing from the neighbors. Talk to the Paw is on sale now everywhere books are sold. Visit kensingtonbooks.com for more info. (laughs) 
Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Continue our conversation with uh, author Melinda Metz. Talk to her about her book, Talk to the Paw. Animal lovers, watch out. This cat will steal your heart. So love that. Perfect for uh, perfect cover. Cute kitty on the front. Melinda, tell us a little bit then about when you put together the book. Tell us a little bit about the, the timing of it. What does it take as far as uh, how long did it take you to put together the uh, the manuscript? How long did the editing take? That whole process from the time it, you got the uh, contact from uh, your editor to the time now it's on the bookshelves. Let's see. The first thing that I do, well, actually with this one, Gary and I talked a little bit about what exactly he was looking for since it was his brainchild. And um, and then the first thing I do is I write a chapter by chapter outline. Some authors just kind of like to dive in and I like to kind of figure out where I'm going first. So that mm-hmm. actually takes a big chunk of my writing time. And then after that, probably maybe in about five months that I wrote the manuscript. And then I sent it off to Gary and then he got back to me with notes and then I did a revision. So probably my whole writing process was probably about seven or eight months. And then at the same time, the publishing company is doing the cover and figuring out the color copy and doing all the stuff that they need to do on their side. I'm definitely one of the writers that's a planner instead of just a pantser just going out there. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and so I think that's interesting about that because you know I've ta- obviously I talked to a lot of uh, writers and authors and um, editors out there, and you know from a, a writing standpoint, it seems like everybody handles a little bit differently. I, I'm probably not myself when I write. I'm, I'm probably not the best at putting together a uh, step-by-step plan of what I want and how I want the framework to look and, and everything. But others, such as yourself, uh, have it a little bit more structured ahead of time. Why is it you think that helps you out? as a writer to have everything on an outline form? It just gives me confidence that what I'm writing will actually make sense. (laughs) I worked at a different kind of publishing company for several years that was called the Book Packager, and we developed book series for other publishers. A lot of times it was book series, like there was a series based on different full house characters and things. And so we wrote a lot of the outlines at the company and then had freelance writers write the books. So I just was really in the habit of of thinking about things in terms of an outline. And I do feel like it's a safety net for me, although I do admire people that have their characters who talk to them or who feel like they get so into it. It's like an outside force because I never really feel that way. You're uh, more structured in how you put it together. Is it for yourself? Do you put together the entire outline before you even put the first letter or word on a manuscript? Do you have to have it that detailed, or is it more of you'll tweak the, you'll put together the main outline and then start to do your work and then tweak the outline as you go along? I definitely make some changes as I go along because I'll realize there was something that I wanted to add or something that wasn't working that I want to change. And sometimes it's almost like you're two different people when you're writing the outline and when you're writing the book. Because sometimes I look at the outline that I wrote and I'm like, I don't know what I was thinking. So then I do change it. But before I start, I kind of have it all planned out. And only about two times out of all the books I've written, I haven't. And I was sorry both times that I realized I, I'm just too in the habit of doing it that way. <laughs> now, have for all the years that you've been writing, have you always been that way, more structured? Or like you said, is that something you've learned through uh, your editing days and through your past uh, histories and past life in this whole uh, publishing <laughs> arena? I didn't become a writer until until I was almost finished being an editor. So I, I was pretty ingrained by that point, I think. I think I was just used to evaluating authors' outlines when I would get outlines from them or creating outlines. So it just became part of my writing style. Also, since a lot of the times I do write with a partner, we usually write the outline together. We plot out everything together, and then we split it in half, and we each write half. So we both need to know where the other person is going before they set off. So That's really interesting you say that. So writing with a partner, is there any logic to how you divide it up into half? Or is it basically, okay, you take chapters 1 through 10, I'll take 11 through 20, and we'll hopefully meet somewhere in the middle, and this makes sense (laughs) at the end. Yeah, that's actually how we do it. And we alternate by no particular method between who starts and who finishes, partly just schedule or, you know, yeah, we just split it down the middle, but we plot it out together. So we come up with the whole story together. Okay. We were both former editors, so then we just kind of edit each other, and then we edit the whole thing. And pretty soon, we can't even remember who wrote what by the time we turn it in. (laughs) So do you find it easier to work with a partner, or do you prefer uh, being the lone wolf and putting together the whole thing? 
I really like writing with a partner. To me, it's much more fun. And they're definitely, I'm working on the sequel to Talk to the Paw right now. It's called Obey the Paw. And there have definitely been times I was like, I wish I was writing with Laura because like, I need to brainstorm or, you know, but sometimes our schedules don't, don't match up. And I just enjoy the process of working with the partner. I have fun writing by myself too, but it's a little more fun writing with Laura. Now, is it when you're writing, uh, walk us through your day as a writer. Are you one of those writers that no matter what you're working on, you have to write X number of words or X number of chapters per day? And are you up at 4.30 in the morning every morning writing? <laughs> or is it more of, oh my gosh, i got a uh, deadline coming up in a month. I better get something on paper. <laughs> yeah, I, I used to be that way where it was like, oh my gosh, the deadline is coming up. I have to drink, you know, a billion diet Dr. Peppers and stay up all night um, <laughs> and get it done. But I work full time at the, at the library here in the children's room. So since I'm working full time, I've had to become much more, I need to write X amount on each of my days off. Otherwise I won't finish. So I've kind of moved from one method to the other. And I really think it takes me about the same amount of time to write the books. It's just that in the previous, before I was, when I was just freelancing, I procrastinated a lot more and now I have to get going when I sit down. And that's real interesting you say that, you know, sometimes, obviously, uh, as writers, you often have to have multiple jobs, at least until you land that uh, that first big series where they just uh, <laughs> pay you big advances <laughs> at a time. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, so when you're when you're doing that, I don't know if one, like you said, is easier than the other, you know, because um, I would find it hard, you know, you're, you're doing your day job, the things that pays the bills and everything. And if you have it, what, what do you do if you have an epiphany that comes up in the middle of, you know, children's reading hour at the library? Uh, <laughs> do you sneak off and write a few uh, notes and a few paragraphs in that? Or do you just simply have to try to hopefully put that in the back of your head and use it when you're ready to sit down and actually put uh, the uh, manuscript together? Yeah, I usually just hope that I'll remember it later. And usually I do. So I feel like, too, I think I'm pretty focused at work when I'm doing story time or something. My mind is not really there's not much time to wander during story time because you have a lot of kids. And, you know, the other day I was doing story time and suddenly four kids had their faces pressed to the window because there was a squirrel out there. You know, I have to compete with squirrels. I have to compete with lots of different things. So I kind of can't really think about anything but what the kids are doing. (laughs) And if I need to start doing a song or switch to something else because I've lost them. So I have to focus. (laughs) You wouldn't think you have to focus so much to do a children's story time, but you kind of do. Uh, yeah, you know, it's uh, sort of like the old showbiz, you know, it, it don't ever work <laughs> with kids or, or animals because, uh, yeah, that makes it a challenge. <laughs> I Plus definitely don't want to work you. with squirrels. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Those squirrels. squirrels will get me every time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right, then. Well, once people pick up a copy of Talk to the Paw and they read through it and enjoy it thoroughly, what do you hope they gain from it? What's uh, one or two things that you think, wow, if they walk away with this, then I'm doing my job? Hmm. You know, I just, I hope that people just have fun with it and it gives them a little break. You know, it's, it's kind of a light and I always want to say fluffy, but then it sounds like I'm trying to make a cat fun. Just, just, just <laughs> a okay. light, fun read. And I, I, I basically hope that they just get a, some entertainment and maybe they can take away a little, a little more cat understanding. So when they look at their cat, they're thinking, are they really trying to help me out with this? Or it exactly. must be just fun. Yeah. And next time a, uh, a smelly pair of bloomers ends up at their doorstep, they know who to look for. So <laughs> Exactly. There's a plan behind it all. <laughs> That's right. There's more to it than just uh, stealing your neighbor's uh, fine uh, lingerie off the line. So <laughs> we'll put it that exactly. way. Exactly. Well, Melinda, where can people find out more about and pick up a copy of the book and follow your activities, any events that you're planning? How's the best way to keep track of you? I think the book's pretty much available most places that, that you would look for books on Amazon and, and independent bookstores and just Barnes & Noble, any, any place that you would go in and Walmart. And I'm on Twitter at just Melinda Metz. And Laura and I have a Facebook page. It's, it's Laura Burns and Melinda Metz. Warren Burns and Lynn so, Benz. Okay, super. Right. Well, so we'll get all that information posted and get it out there so everybody keep track of all your activities and everything you've got going on with uh, this book and other books and appearances, things of this sort. And uh, everybody go pick up a copy. It's a fun book. It's Talk <laughs> to the Paul by Melinda Metz. Great storylines, little hidden messages underneath there so you can get to know your kitty friends a little bit better. And uh, most of all, it's just a, just a lot of fun. So everybody pick up a copy of that. Melinda, thanks for coming on the show today. I appreciate it so much. Uh, congratulations on a great book and uh, we'll look forward to chatting with you some more down the road well thanks again for having me on i really appreciate it our pleasure all right well we're coming to the end of the show today i want to thank everyone for listening to animal rights on pet life radio i want to thank our producers and sponsors for making this show possible if you have any questions comments or ideas for the show 
You can go to PetLifeRadio.com and send us an email. And while you're there, check out all the other wonderful shows and hosts and uh, great activities going on at Pet Life Radio. That's PetLifeRadio.com. So until next time, write a great story about the animals in your life. Put it in a blog, an article, or in a book. And who knows, you may be the next guest on Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have a great day. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.